from downtown Decatur, it's the Faber Files. Hello, I'm your host, Bill Faber. The Faber Files is a public access TV program where we talk about community interests and issues. Nowhere else on broadcast TV is there an opportunity to have conversations with citizens and guests about interests that are vital to our community. This evening, we have a special guest, Dr. Reverend Cecilia Williams Bryant comes to us as she's going to make a very special presentation here in Decatur called the HIV Let's Talk program. Reverend, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. I've really been looking forward to this opportunity to be, I believe, the first uh, minister at our district level on the favor file. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been very lucky to have Reverend Clarington from St. Peter's AME Church be our guest. And she's a really dynamic woman, and she's really, really excited about having you come to our community to speak. Well, we believe that having Reverend Clarington in this region is going to have an impact for years to come. She's a woman with a local commitment and a global vision, and that really has meant a great deal to our congregations in this region. Let's talk about what she's excited about, and that's your program coming up here uh, called Let's Talk. Let's Talk is an attempt to bridge the gap between the silence and the circumstances with regard to HIV AIDS in African American communities. The season for the black church to remain silent has come roaring to an end. As we look at the statistics, as we look at the impact on families, as we look at the numbers who are infected and affected by HIV AIDS, we who are the leaders of the African Methodist Church must now try to restore healing, restore sanity, and restore divine order to the lives of our people. And this is the message that you're delivering to the women and young girls in our community. Tomorrow the word is we are not powerless. Essentially, God wants us well, and we have to collaborate with God in our healing in terms of making right decisions, in terms of entering healthy relationships, in terms of deciding what we want our communities to look like beyond this decade. What is the strategy or the plan that you're, you're advising the women and girls of our community? Tomorrow, what we are going to do is take the taboo off discussions of sexuality, off discussions of HIV and AIDS. We're committed to exposing the myths, presenting the realities, and giving our women and girls in a safe environment and an opportunity to learn what it really is and what they can do to take responsibility for their own health. What practical steps are you recommending to your audience in terms of, of breaking through the taboos? The Women in Ministry of the Illinois Conference have published specifically for this event, Let's Talk, HIV AIDS A to Z. And what it does is give us an understanding of the causes of AIDS and to know that it's 100% preventable and then healthy, responses to AIDS. While we're educating the women and motivating the women, we're also going to be testing the adult women to take the stigma off being tested. This is an issue apparently that has come to the forefront for you. How so? Well, when I consider what the past 10 years of my life have been like, I've had primary ministry in West Africa, South Africa, Los Angeles, hello, and now uh, Chicago and Decatur. What I'm seeing is devastating because the number of young women who are being infected by HIV AIDS in the black community is escalating, disproportionate to our figures in the population. What that has to do with is ignorance, what that has to do with is the reluctance of our elders to really confront this disease and to demythologize it, to take the stigmas off it. it. Takes great courage to break through those taboos, Reverend. 
Yes, it does. <laughs> and um, if I had not been in a ministry to women for over 40 years, I think I too would back up. But I recognize that I cannot be concerned about the AIDS orphans in Soweto and not confront the AIDS, those suffering with AIDS in Decatur. And so what I want us to do is to get a personal and global perspective on AIDS, take the shame away from it, take the fear out of it, and then help us to know as women and girls that we can take authority over our lives. What do you hope that your audience will take away from your conference? Let's talk. My expectation is that that model will be replicated in large group settings, small group settings, family settings, mother-daughter settings, and that from this will emerge a collaboration of clergy, health professionals, legislators, and those who have a civic mindedness to eliminate, to eradicate HIV AIDS. My heart is that my granddaughters can envision a future without AIDS. In your experience, what has been the relationship with the black community and the medical community in terms of confronting HIV AIDS? I've had a, a wonderful relationship with health professionals. Just this August, I was able to take 87 health professionals and uh, intercessors to the Kingdom of Lesotho, which is in Southern Africa, which has a high rate of HIV AIDS. And these physicians went on their own time, on their own dime, and made a serious impact on those who were suffering there. When it comes to the U.S., as I've approached health professionals, they've been very open and supportive to help us to eliminate this as an issue. Reverend, if you had physicians gathered around the table here as we talk, what would you ask of them, what would you tell of them in terms of supporting your effort? I would say that it's imperative, no matter what a person comes in for, if it's a broken hip, to encourage our people to be tested. Mm -hmm. Because the mythology around who really has it is what is causing the disease to spread. We assume a certain type person must have AIDS, but all of us are vulnerable. So being tested, and then I would look to the health professionals to help clergy get a clear understanding of what the symptoms and resources are for those who are living with HIV AIDS. I would also encourage the women who are health professionals to create settings in which they're dialoguing with women and girls about their sexuality, about their body temple life, as we would say, and encourage them to take steps that would keep them healthy. Have you run into any difficulties in terms of um, getting cooperation from, from, um, from health professionals in confronting this issue? No, I haven't. Our, our problem is with regard to health care in African American and also poor communities is persons wait until the symptoms are just tragic before they seek out help. And we need to find ways to help people to make that decision to seek help early. What about our schools, Reverend? What are your thoughts about their involvement in terms of this education, this let's talk approach? I think age appropriate conversation would be very helpful mm -hmm. and very healthy in our school settings just as there are now in some settings you have conversations around sexuality, mm -hmm. those who have permission from parents. I think it's important that, especially in communities where the statistics are very high, that that conversation be held very early. You know, the moms and dads who are watching this evening, listening to you talk, or the grandparents who are raising uh, their grandchildren, they may not understand what is an appropriate age for their, for their grandchild or daughter or their son or grandson. What, what, what age groups are you suggesting that parents begin this conversation? Well, um, in San Francisco, there's an organization called Grandparents Who Care. And these are the grandparents whose children are HIV and AIDS affected, and the grandparents now have to raise the children. And because they work together, 
they were able to get the legislators to say that grandparents raising grandchildren of AIDS uh, patients can now receive foster care support so that their finances are no longer drained. And that came from collective action. When it comes to age appropriateness, I think just as we discussed with our children that some children have polio, um, that some children have cancer, to say that some people have HIV and AIDS, and it makes them very sick. We don't have to go into a genealogical or sexual conversation, mm -hmm. but to include that among the diseases, just like we openly discuss other chronic diseases like high blood pressure and diabetes, and children hear that. Mm -hmm. um, Granny's got to take her diabetes medicine, even though Granny's naughty and eats the cake, okay? <laughs> so um, to have that conversation and let them know that some, because sometimes they're going to school with children who may have been born with mm -hmm. HIV AIDS because of their prenatal um, conditions. So I think to take it from out of the dark, put it in the light, make it part of ordinary health and healing conversations would be a benefit to families. You know, Reverend, our community of Decatur has about 78,000 people according to the, the census, but we are a very churched community. We have over a hundred churches in our small okay. community. If the clergy were gathered around the table as we talk, what would you tell the men and women of our local clergy about the issue that you're confronting and addressing? I would say to the pastors, if you're serious about growing your church, if you're serious about having an impact on this generation, then you must also be serious about HIV and AIDS. The reality is in the gospel, there are only three things that Jesus required, preaching, teaching, and healing. And many of us are content to pray for those who are already sick, but do not take the action for preventive of diseases, for prevention of sickness. And in my community, my word is that the civil rights generation has to learn how to talk to the hip hop generation. And the hip hop generation has to learn how to make themselves understood to the civil rights generation because we are all in this together. That's extraordinarily well said. And I think it's never, I've never heard a phrase that way where you define the generations of the civil rights and the hip hop generations. Yes. That, that's a reality in our communities. And until clergy face the cultural context of this generation, mm. The pews will continue to empty because they're going to have what? More burials than marriages, more funerals than baptisms because they're not prepared to engage the cultural mores of the young generation. So what is your advice to the local ministers about bridging that gap between the civil rights generation and the hip hop generation? That terrible gift called listening. Listening. And out when, when you and I were going to church, it was all about listening. But this generation is a visual generation. Mm -hmm. They've got to see it. Mm -hmm. And so we who are now the leaders have to position ourselves to hear what it is that this young generation is feeling, experiencing, and seeing. Last month I was in Los Angeles a guest at what they call the Underground Church. The Underground Church. The Underground Church. And it is a hip-hop generation church. The pastor is half uh, Brazilian and half Asian, and his wife is also Brazilian. The praise leaders, or as we would call the senior choir, were up in the front with the jeans on and the sweatshirts, I didn't hear all the words that they were singing, but I heard Jesus. They were saying Jesus regularly. The whole congregation was up, joyous, praising God. And then when it was time for the sermon, he sat down. And the familiarity of that with the um, Beatitudes, it says, and Jesus went up to a high place, and he sat down and began to teach them. After all of that holy noise, the pastor sat down 
and talked to them in such a sweet conversational tone about who Jesus is and what Jesus means in your life. When he finished, seven or eight young people came and accepted Jesus as Lord. What a powerful gesture for the minister to take a seat. Yes, and so I've invited him to come and minister to my young people in Chicago yeah. and to teach our pastors hip-hop praise. Because if you're going to reach the hip-hop generation, you have to reach them, not with what worked in 1956, but you have to reach them where they are. Yes. You have a very fine educational background, Reverend. Uh, Boston College, am I correct? Boston University, University. Yes. yes. I was a political science uh, uh, major, in which I majored in political theory and international relations at Boston University. And what is it that called you to the ministry? Jesus. <laughs> and um, I couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. I couldn't figure it out. Um, until I accepted the call and realized that he was preparing me for global impact from the perspective of the Great Commission, go ye into all the world. And so everything that I do, the Lord shows me the thread between the personal, the local, the neighborhood, the national, the yes. global, and that's who I am. Reverend, so many people have their ears open to the Lord and are listening and trying to hear his, his, his word, his message, his calling. How did that come to you? I was minding my own business, sitting in a church where my husband was the pastor, and the Holy Spirit came to me and said, preach. And I got very still. Then the Holy Spirit said again, preach. So I immediately got up, left church, put my coat on, and went home. And when I had escaped, sat in my living room chair, the Holy Spirit said to me, when you preach, you're going to become an even better mother and a better wife and a better servant of God. So the next week I accepted my call. That's a powerful story. And now my son is a pastor. He's founded a church. Um, he has his doctorate from Oxford. My daughter is a, a preacher. She has her PhD from Duke in psychology. She's a liturgical dancer. And I have spoken prophecy over my five granddaughters that they'll all rise up and be great women of God. In terms of education, what is your message to the group that you're going to be speaking with about pursuing an education or a career or a calling? The message is success in learning is success in life. Success in learning is, is success, success in life. Success in life. How's that? Well, what I've learned um, from those who build penitentiaries is they do a survey of the reading level of children in the third grade, and they know by the reading levels of children in the third grade how many more prisons they will need. They also know that a son born to an unwed mother, teenage mother, is most likely going to also be a prisoner. Success in learning is success in life. If a child, I'm second of ten children from the projects of New York, success in learning is success in life. When I left the projects, I left the projects because success in learning yes. is success in life. You know, Reverend, many would say that uh, our country now has an extraordinary president. Uh, of course, he's boxed up in the White House. Yes. You're out there with the people. Yes. If our president were at our table this evening, what would you tell him? The first thing I would do is pray for him. Right now, what Barack Obama needs more than anything else is the prayers and intercessions of people of God all over the country. What's happening in this world, even as we speak, has such diabolical engagement on every geographic region, from the Middle East to Africa to Asia to Europe. And here he sits 
as the leader of the free world with all of those dynamics, all the conflicting advice that he's receiving, and I would pray for him and admonish him to maintain the posture in prayer of Solomon, which was, God, give me wisdom. And I pray wisdom for Barack Obama and the refreshing of his spirit, because this is a terrible time. Unlike in Tale of Two Cities, which was the best of times and the worst of times, this is a terrible time. That's an expression of a beautiful sentiment. And I know really key to your, I understand, to your religious viewpoint are the, the great beatitudes of our Lord. Absolutely. The blessed are. The blessed. Just to understand that in whatever feeble effort we're in to obey God, no matter what it looks like at the outset, just the intention the motive to good, to do good, incurs blessing. Blessed are you when you're pure of heart. Blessed are you when people, because they really don't understand you, persecute you or make fun of you. Blessed are you when you're mourning. Blessed are you when what you really want is righteousness and goodness. And when the blessing is enough, you're free to obey God. You're free to obey God. Reverend, you expressed just a beautiful message of bringing people together, working together, and, 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 and you know, being, uh, being brothers and sisters in a way. And yet today, all day, 24 hours uh, a day, and for seven days a week, we hear and talk radio, talk television, voices of hatred, voices of separation, voices of division, voices of, of, of prejudice. How do you respond to that in, in light of the beautiful spirit that you are suggesting? It's because they have the mic. I believe, even as God said to Elijah, that there are thousands who have not bowed down. Mm -hmm. But if you follow the thread, even those reality shows that are being promoted are those that show hostility and bickering and contempt. If you had the mic that Glenn Beck had right now, just imagine the number of persons who would be impacted by this conversation. Yes. But here we are without sponsors. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. How, how is it, Reverend, in this great country that professes equality that um, you don't have the mic, but Glenn Beck does? Well, I think it's a matter of monetary control. And in a very real sense, that even tomorrow, if someone shoots someone to buy drugs, they're going to get the news report. But if we have a hundred or more young women and young girls together, coming together to create a new future, it will go unreported. Yes, yes. Quite a paradox. Yes, it is. Reverend, thank you for joining us and, and for visiting Decatur. We hope you come back often and visit us. I look forward to it. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Clinton.